much for allowing me to, to be here today. Can everyone hear me? Is this low enough? Um, thank you, Diane and Matt, for this opportunity to come and to speak to the Women's Civic Forum. I don't frequently get an opportunity to come due to my work schedule, but this is just a tremendous experience, and I appreciate the IHMC for allowing this to happen today. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my research team and some of the members of the audience who have kind of been an, an adjunct research team. Uh, Dr. James Gominacci, Bill Kaplinger, and we have Art Parrish, he's on uh, the phone, he's out of town, but he's with us via teleconference. I'd also like to recognize uh, Maureen DeWeese. She has done lots of research with her blog and published a lot of the findings. I'd also like to recognize uh, Rick Outson, he's an audience. He has done a tremendous amount of research. He's taken everything that we've put together. He's uh, tried his best to find holes in it, and he's done his own independent research and uh, hired attorneys and investigators and has been a great help. Uh, I don't see Will Eastern in the audience, but if he's here, um, no, no, not here today, but he's also been a valued researcher on this effort. Um, we'll go to the next slide, Bill. Uh, for those of you who haven't ever had the opportunity to, to come down to the Long Hollow neighborhood, it is, it is immediately east of Palafox Street and it's north of Wright Street. It is the lowest point between East Hill and North Hill. This is an image of our neighborhood park, which was done all with neighborhood dollars and state grants. Every bit of the artwork that you see is done by local artists, and we are stewards of our earth, and so everything is made using recycled uh, materials. The next slide. Uh, another image of our park. Again, uh, local artists have been used. Go. This is Pensacola's only uh, labyrinth. Uh, in the entire region. It's a wonderful place of quiet, reflection, and meditation. Uh, well, there's, I think there's a new one now at the Methodist Church in Gulf Braves, but um, this is the only one in Pensacola. We go to the next slide. This is Gilmard Street, and these are some of our turn-of-the-century homes that you'll find in our neighborhood. Next slide. This is the AME Chapel Church, which is built in the early 1900s. And to the left of that is the back side of the, um, the Baptist Church. We have many churches. We have the Wright Street Methodist Church. We have the Greater Union Baptist Church. Um, <coughs> let's see, we have this church. It's, we have five big churches in the neighborhood. Next slide. Going on down the street, you'll see another turn of the century cottage. And across the street from it are some new uh, modern infill homes, which were workforce housing, and they were built along the same lines of the homes that you'll see in Aragon and North Hill. Next slide. And again, uh, more new compatible workforce housing built next to turn of the century cottages. On down the street, another view of those. On down the street, uh, another turn of the century home, which is across the street from the neighborhood park. Next slide. Uh, our neighborhood park. Next slide. This is our little community center. It's also a not-for-profit open books. Uh, it has, it's a wonderful opportunity for our neighborhood to have some eyes on the park and to have a neighborhood bookstore. And then just down the street from that, next slide, is the First City Arts Center. And I'm, I'm seeing lots of your faces there. Um, they also have lots of classes, lots of art elements. And these were things that were not originally in our neighborhood, that, that the neighborhood worked with other not-for-profits to, to bring that element into these formerly industrial spaces. And then on down the street, uh, we, this is the turn of the century Pensacola Gas and Water Works building. Uh, the city was going to tear it down and bulldoze it and put it in a landfill and some very um, forward-thinking people the president of our neighborhood association bought it and refurbished it, and now it's a wonderful live-work component in our neighborhood. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, Mana Food Bank is one of our neighborhood partners. Uh, they were severely flooded two times in our neighborhood, and now, unfortunately, are trying to to find another place to live, and we're going to be very sad to lose them. They've been a vital part of our neighborhood. Next slide. 
Again, some new infill housing. This was once an abandoned uh, site that the school board owned, and we have put four new workforce housing units on this property. It was a, uh, a collaborative effort between the neighborhood and the city of Pensacola. This is our long hauler stormwater pond. Uh, Bill, if you'll go back to that last slide, to show you where that is in relation to our, in our neighborhood, if you go straight up this street, this street dead ends into this conservation district in this long hollow pond. Next slide. It's not really a pond. If you can see this, this is like a lake. This is one of Pensacola's secret assets to have this type of a water source in the middle of, of a, a built-out city. Um, it should look like Admiral Mason Park. It should have pathways, it should have water features, it should have benches. It's in a conservation district, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's kind of equivalent on a state level to what a national park would be. That it is set aside for the public so that we have an opportunity to enjoy nature and to have that, that opportunity to save some of these Florida lands. It's also used as a stormwater pond, and the fact that we have this actually lowers each and every one of your flood insurance rates. The more properties like this that we conserve for stormwater, the lower your flood rates are. Um, if you can see, you can see the pond, but just north of the pond at the top of the screen is the area that we have been talking about. It's six and a half acres, and if you'll notice right up here is where the, where the tower. That was once a radio tower that was used for EMS services for the city of Pensacola, and it was built in 1952, long before this was a conservation district. The city abandoned it in the 70s when it started getting old, and then they leased it out to a not-for-profit radio station. Then in 1991, as this tower is aging and they're looking at all these things like stormwater and flood water, the city set this side, property aside and rezoned it to a conservation district. The one thing you can't put there is development and a radio tower. You can put park benches there, you can put jogging trails there, you can put a boat launch there, you can put picnic tables, you can put things there for the public to use. Think again of a national park, the things that you'd see in a national park. You would not put a electrified radio tower there that required a chain link fence around the entire property that blocks the public away from public land. But that fence is there because that radio station is there. Now our neighborhood, we started meeting with the city. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I, it's just not clear to me. I can't see where the water is. Is it the big water? Okay, we'll go, ba we'll go back there. I'll show you. Go, ba go back to that slide, Bill. Okay. Maybe everybody else knows. All, all of this is water. The black. Okay. The black. Why is it so dark? It just doesn't look like water. It's 30 feet deep. It's what? 30 feet deep. All this is water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The areas in here where you're seeing some light, those are areas where it's no longer 30 feet deep, which is what it's supposed to be. And it's no longer 30 feet deep because over the years, silt deposits have been allowed to accumulate, which have reduced the capacity. And that's why you're seeing a lot of that light area. And that's one of our neighborhood concerns is why isn't it being dredged every five years, which is what DEP says it has to be dredged. So. That is the property where we see as a neighborhood that this pond can be expanded. Last year, the city conducted a study and found out that that pond does not meet the mandatory 25-year stormwater requirements. It is only meeting a five-year stormwater requirement. That is bad. We're not talking about a 100-year flood. We're talking about a five-year flood, which is a 5% chance of happening every single year. So we can go to the next slide. Next slide, Bill. Okay. Here is in February 2015, last year, this is a Google Earth photograph, and you can see there's a new tower going up. The old tower was here. The new tower is here. The new equipment building, all built without permits, is right up there at the top of Jordan. 
at this time, when we start seeing this go up, we start talking to the city. Because we've been told since 1999. As soon as that tower ages out, it's gone. It can't be rebuilt. can't be expanded. It's done. We're out of there. The uh, April 2014 flood destroyed that tower because water breached the foundations and raised up the guide wires. And so that, that tower was toast. So when we saw a building going on, we started talking to the city. We started getting ignored by the city. Next slide. This is a map that just shows, and it's very hard to see, but the green areas on this map show you how few conservation districts we have in our city. And again, this is what's going to lower your flood insurance rates. I'll, I'll go and point them to you. Here. Here. Here and here. That's it. That's all we set aside. That's all we set aside. Next, next slide. That's why it's so important. You have to protect what we have. This is what our stormwater pond should look like. This is Admiral Mason Pond. This is also the prototype of what we're going to do at the Corinne Jones Community Center on Gregory Street. We're going to spend $1.4 million putting in an attractive stormwater pond because the city understands why we need more of these and, and we need to protect the one that we have. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> Conservation District, 1991. We're not talking about a zoning change that happened last month and nobody knew about it. it. Happened a long time ago. We've been talking with them since 1999 about what would happen when that tower aged out, which is why we were very confused when building started happening. It says, past the 1991, all of that long hollow <coughs> basin between Jordan Street and Marino, here to four, will be open space. It will be Conservation District. And then the next slide, it talks about the purposes. Necessary for <coughs> preventing flood damage. Generalized uses permitting wildlife and vegetation conservation. Wildlife refuge. This area is one of our bird estuaries. We have many groups who go birding in this area. And bless their hearts, these people crawl underneath that fence to get there because it's so rare, the bird, that that migrates and comes and, and spends time here. It's really lovely, and if you ever go up Gillimard Street, you can get out of your car and you can go and look at this wonderful site. It would be like a Central Park type element in our city if it was developed uh, the way it should be. So you can have a recreation facility, you can have a passive trail, a bike trail, a jog trail, a boat mooring, a little fishing pier, and drainage areas. Nowhere in this list does it say a radio tower. Next slide. So then you start breaking down the ordinances of okay, where can communication, communication towers go. Guess what? It, no, number one paragraph. It can't go in a conservation district. We have all the ordinances in place, but for some reason they were ignored. Next slide. This is what happened in 2012. This is not a 100-year storm. This is 2012. This is our neighborhood. At this storm, we didn't have as much water intrusion in homes, but we did have almost every car in the neighborhood was lost. Next slide. This is Gillimard Street. And again, at the very top of that slide to the north is that pond that only is a five-year pond when it's supposed to be a 25-year. All that water that doesn't, it can't be held there, it overflows the wall and it comes down into our neighborhood. And then it flows on into downtown. And again, that was 2012. That wasn't even the big flood that you know, we're never going to have again. This is 2014, and you can see it's substantially higher at this point. Um, this is when almost every home in our neighborhood had between three and five feet of water. And when we almost lost our president of our neighborhood association when she was trapped in her home, furniture got picked up and moved, and it blocked a door. And if her son, I don't know how he heard her screaming, because you saw that big brick building where she lived. And he heard her, and he heard her scream, and she was drowning. She's only five feet tall. And the water at that point was five feet four inches, and she was drowning trying to get out of this room. And her son heard her scream, and he kicked the door in, and he told her to swim underwater and just find his hands. And he pulled her out, and she survived. But they lost everything on this first floor, which was their business. 
And uh, so this is the importance of the storm flooding, is that luckily there was no loss of life with that flood in 2014, just barely. And this is why it's so important for us to research it and ask these questions, because this could have very easily been another Katrina event. And we don't want that to happen in our community. Uh, next slide. This is what happened on further on downtown. Again, during the 2014 flood, the levee on our pond broke. The whole earth wall broke, and all that water went flushing down Tarragona Street. So flood water doesn't know a neighborhood. It flooded through Long Hollow and North Hill. It went down through Seville, went into Aragon, and then into downtown. And what we've learned from all the engineering studies is that we have to fix this problem the north end of our city. Because when we get down here to where we're sitting right now, we are just feet above sea level. So we can't put a 30 foot deep pond right here at IHMC. But we can put it up there where we have one and it can hold a lot of water. We estimated that we can hold 2.3 billion gallons of more water if that six and a half acres where that tower is taking up because of its big guide wire supports. If we took that six and a half acres back and dredged it to 30 feet deep, 2.4 billion gallons of water. The city is going to minimize that impact, but I don't know how you can minimize that impact for six and a half acres when on MLK you're developing a 50 foot wide residential lot for a stormwater pond at the price of $150,000. We already own this. You own this. This is your land. So the next slide. This is Aragon. This is what happened. And Aragon, which is just right here, they get flooded all the time. It is horrible. It is horrible. And again, this water knows no district, and we have got to start working on, on maintaining it. Next slide. Here is the old tower, and you can see this old original tower.